So I want to welcome everybody to this informal uh, Peabody showcases that just evolved. Uh, our class of 1970 had a um, COVID pause in our reunion plans. And we were to have a reunion last June. And obviously we didn't. And so we did a virtual Zoom one with about 75 classmates. And, uh, and it was, people generally enjoyed that. We did a, did a couple other little things like that. And then a couple months ago, uh, when our June 2021 50th reunion is postponed to November 5th, 2021, uh, I thought, well, let's just try to keep, get some th things together. And so we came up, I came up with this concept of the showcase of having classmates talk about their work or their presentations. And Sandy Seltzer and Adrian Arch were first. And uh, that link is up on the YouTube. And then Michael Monard was uh, last month. So we're just gonna do this second Monday of the month uh, and have one, maybe sometimes two people. And we uh, are gonna record them and have them available. And tonight we're going to showcase uh, Pam Gold, Pamela Golden, Pam Golden of the Golden Girls, Pat and Pam uh, from Peabody High School. And uh, Pam and I have been, uh, been preparing this and I'm really eager to start, but just in case a couple more people join us, um, I'm gonna tell you the kind of, uh, the horizon events here, so to say. Uh, uh, first of all, as I said, we're gonna do these every month. I'm not gonna take a pause for summer. We already have the next three or four lined up. Uh, Mo Seeger is gonna be next month. Uh, he's a, a poet in Paris. Uh, then the following month, uh, Chuck Di Sabato, who has been our reunion uh, guru for the last 50 years, might I say. Um, He's going to talk about his work in Africa with the Rotary building a library there and some of his other humanitarian civil works. And then um, we're going to have um, the Cardillo brothers, Rob and Harry. Uh, Rob is a photographer. Uh, he showed some of his uh, amazing pictures at our 50th reunion Zoom. And his brother, Harry, who is a very well-known pianist, is going to join him and they're going to do a little music and, and pictures and uh, that month. And then Gary Malnick, who's on the call now, I coached him into giving us a presentation leading discussion on life in outer space. Okay, so uh, Gary is an astrophysicist at Harvard and also presented at our reunion. Uh, then we have a few more other people I've been uh, tracking and twisting their arms and I'd like to work through anybody who wants to present um, at our class this year. And then we've opened it up last meeting to any Peabody graduate. And I think we have about, probably about a half a dozen to a dozen uh, people from other classes here. Some for the first time, we welcome you all. And my intent is to make this a Peabody thing. And as I said, we're kind of working through our class, but I know there are other people in other classes who uh, have some very interesting things to talk about. So. The intent is as we exhaust anybody from our class who wants to do it, that we will move on to the other classes maybe in the fall or so in continuing the recording. And I ask each of you, um, if you have any Peabody grads that you're friends with, you have their emails, ask them if they would like to be on the list because I would really encourage uh, all of us to uh, connect. Uh, many of us know each other because we're in closer classes, but. I've already made a few Peabody friends from people I didn't know uh, through this Zoom. So I want to encourage the building a community. Um, and so with that, uh, I will go ahead and we'll start a presentation. Uh, we will have open discussion and questions at the end. So I just ask that we kind of just move along and keep moving. Uh, and uh, there's no timeline on this. People can obviously enter and leave whenever they want but we will have opportunities at the end. So with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Pam Golden. Uh, and uh, I have to say, I, I wasn't, um, I knew Pam uh, more like to say hello in uh, high school, never really um, got to know her in high school, but I did run into her, P 
periodically over the last 50 years, generally at a nonprofit or charitable event. Um, and uh, I knew she was very active in the community. So I learned a lot about Pam that I've missed, uh, unfortunately, the last 50 years. I haven't really been um, a lot of in touch with her. We cut cross paths, but I'm really excited to, to share uh, Pam's uh, information and what she's doing. So I just want to um, ask you, Pam, here. Uh, I noticed that um, a lot of Peabody people aren't in town anymore. You're here, so tell, tell us uh, what kept you in Pittsburgh. Go ahead, Pam. Okay, so I'm gonna start, but the first thing I'm gonna do, I wanna do two things. One is, um, Bob, I wanna thank you, even before you asked me to do this, um, I, I have felt that you were doing a great job of curating this series, so thank you for your efforts. Um, and then the second thing is this was odd for me because this isn't really what I do. I've um, had a series of jobs that you'll talk about, I'll talk about, but the, um, the common thread was in marketing and in communications. And really that's what kept me here. I consider myself pretty lucky. I mean, a lot of it was also perseverance and hard work and having, knowing some of the right people and just a combination of things um, that, kept me here. I was lucky enough to get some great jobs. I worked at WQED, worked at McGee Women's Hospital, with the Cultural Trust, um, some, a number of places. So I'll come back and talk about those. But the other thing was, frankly, one of the reasons I stayed in Pittsburgh, it was a question of the devil I knew versus the devil I didn't know. And I kind of knew what to expect in Pittsburgh and what not to expect. And um, you know, in some cases, and particularly with regard to race, there were limitations. And so for that, but um, I was also lucky. I, I graduated from college. I graduated from Pitt and went to Europe for six weeks. And I came back and then started working and I've been working ever since. So you see the WQED slide up. I, um, I actually, my first job was, um, I worked very briefly for like nine months at the Salvation Army took it on the chin, a lot of jokes from my friends about ringing the kettle bell, but I was in the communications department. I love the work, I, but then another opportunity came along um, and I got hired to um, work as a production assistant for um, Don Brockett, Chef Brockett. And so, you know, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood was actually after our generation, wasn't really ours. But Don, so Don was a chef, played the chef rocket on Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, but he also mounted reviews and did industrial shows around the country. And so I became his production assistant and got to do um, lots of fun things working with him. For one thing, I got to be an extra on a set. So there I am with the <coughs> lampshade on my head. I wasn't even loaded, but there I was. And the, um, to my stage left, the, the, um, you might not recognize this person, but let's see if any. Well, we're not going to let anyone guess, so we'll just tell. Go ahead. Yeah, because he's got his hand in front of his face, but that is actually Batman, Beetlejuice, Michael Keaton, um, who was also in in that show. So I worked at WQED for about um, twelve years, and we worked hard, but it was enriching, it was enlightening, it was enjoyable. Alex Haley, um, Alex came to the studio um, to record a program. He stayed at my parents' house and it was just a lovely and humble person. And um, we have a family picture, a picture with our family. There we are with the family. Um, um, but then uh, one thing that you may or may not know is I was, I was at WQEDD at a time when it was a powerhouse producer for national programs for PBS. We produced the national, we co-produced with the National Geographic Society National Geographic specials. I used to do these media tours. We would set up things to try to get press for our shows. So I got to go to the Okie Finoki Swamp with two alligator experts and we're um, floating down the swamp in these uh, canoes looking for alligators and we found them, but luckily they knew what to do. So <laughs> that was fun. A couple months ago, I was looking at the New York Times bestseller list and I realized that I had met three of the 10 authors on that list, including 
uh, Delia Owens, who wrote Where the Crawdads Sing. She and her husband, Mark, were producers of geographic specials um, before she became a best-selling author. Um, WQED produced a family entertainment series called Once Upon a Classic, and um, it featured such shows as Anne of Green Gables stories, as Anne of Green Gables uh, Chronicles of Narnia. Um, so I got to meet Dick Cavett. We also produced a series called The Previn in the Pittsburgh. Um, got to be to meet um, Andre Previn, Maestro Previn, and Ella Fitzgerald for a reception. Um, and we we produced a um, a variety series called um, Kennedy Center Tonight. And um, so one of the things I had lots of opportunities like this, but one of the things that I got to do is. I took vibra harpist Lionel Hampton on a media tour. So we went to New Orleans and Detroit and our last stop was the Rose Garden of the White House where um, the Reagans um, hosted, a, um, hosted a, a reception. Hamp was a big Republican, so um, they welcomed us for that. Um, in addition to being able to meet a lot of interesting people, I got to travel a lot. At that point, which is, this was um, the 70s and into the 80s, WQED had a post-production center office in um, Los Angeles and we had a development office in New York. Um, so I got to go to, to those offices several times a year. Um, I also got to, I served, um, got to go to Ireland to serve on a um, panel that juried an international film competition and we hosted receptions with, or we attended receptions at um, the Australian and the Japanese embassies that were hosted by the respective ambassadors. So from WQED, I went to McGee where I headed the communications department. Um, and at that time, the hospital was establishing a partnership with the maternity hospital in uh, Moscow. So I got to go to Russia four times, to Moscow four times and St. Petersburg once. Um, and so there, there are a couple of newborns that are swaddled and being carried by nurses. And it was just very interesting to look at their different delivery systems. Our docs said that they were very good at tactile medicine because they didn't have all the fancy equipment that we had. And they had things like, they didn't even have a cafeteria. So families would have to, if a mother delivered, families would have to bring food to the hospitals. The other things is they wouldn't let visitors in. So the mother would deliver the baby and then they would go to the window and stand up and hold the baby up to the window so people could see the newborn. But um, it was just a great, that was a great experience. So then um, we, um, one of the thing on one of the trips, um, the McGee team um, led by the hospital president in green um, welcome to gave um, First Lady Hil Hillary Clinton a tour and a partnership briefing. So there I am in the background um, on that delegation. Um, and while there, I got to live with a Russian family because it was a long trip and we would usually go for 10 to 12 days. So this is the family. Um, the father, Sasha in the gray was a a jewelry maker and um, he had gone to jail for because he had dealt in the black market and got caught. Um, but this family lived really very well because the grandmother, there were, um, that's the, the grandmother's seated and the, the grandson on, on her lap. Um, they were very high up in the communist party. So their apartment was four rooms and with one bath. But there was a time if they hadn't been ranking party officials, they would have had three or four families living in unrelated families assigned to and living in in that apartment. But um, so that was that was a great experience. And I, while I traveled back and forth, I was able to bring a lot of caviar and vodka, which made me very popular at some of the dinner parties in Pittsburgh. Um, so yeah, there's yeah, that that was the other thing is um, most of the trips were several of the trips were in in January, February, and March. So there we there we are. There I am at uh, um, in Red Square. Um, so from um, from McGee, I went to uh, the Cultural Trust, um, and I've always been involved in the arts, whether it was professionally or as a volunteer. And one of the things is, is I've heard people talk about what they're doing is how important the arts seems to be to 
our generation. And I, I, I suspect it's the early exposure that is so critical. So I worked there for five years. Um, and for people who are outside of the area, um, I worked at the Cultural Trust, which owns four of the five theaters in downtown Pittsburgh, not Heinz Hall, and also owns several um, art galleries. The Cultural District is a 16 block area um, in central downtown. Um, and the trust with a big boost from the foundation community converted what was a red light district with shops like Doc Johnson's marital aids and things like that, converted this red light district into a top destination and an economic engine for the city. So while I worked there, I got to de develop a number of projects to engage um, students from elementary school age kids to college students to the arts. So one of the things that I got to do is I took Kurt Vonnegut to Alderdice High School. Um, and um, he just, he gave a talk and kids came with armloads of his books and he just couldn't have been more gracious. He just signed all of them. And uh, that's, that's the two of us on the by him stage after um, his performance or his presentation at the Cultural Trust. So, um, I, and I got to do a number of things like that. I, for the, so um, we took um, kids on tours, docent tours through uh, um, the art galleries um, with, and exposed them to art by Jacob Lawrence. Um, I developed a, um, a sampler program for college students that was included a, you buy six tickets for $60 and you'd get one opera, one ballet, one symphony, one Broadway show, um, and one um, public theater production, and I think one city theater production. But um, I worked with a great creative team at one of the agencies. And so we had, it was a six, um, six program sampler and they came up with this great tag. It was try our six pack. So I love that. But um, the idea was to get kids off the camp, students off the campus and into um, arts programs. So from the trust, I went to the Allegheny Conference on Community Development uh, and where my team and um, worked um, to elevate the Pittsburgh profile nationally and to articulate all that the city had to offer so that Pittsburgh would be considered when business decisions were being made about where to locate companies. So we would work hard on things like we helping to attract the all-star game to, to the city. And then in conjunction with that, um, a friend who was a frequent collaborator and I came up with an idea. Um, we uh, created this button that's ask me, I'm a Pittsburgher. We started giving them to people to wear. So if somebody was from out of town and wanted directions, they would, they would know they could ask you. And um, this actually ended up being enthusiastically embraced. We started getting calls from and all over the country, an email from all over the country from people, former Pittsburghers saying, will you please send me buttons? So that was a fun thing to work on. Um, another thing I, I had the opportunity to work on is when um, Jeopardy came to Pittsburgh to Peterson Center and recorded shows. And I got to um, draft some Pittsburgh focused questions. Um, so from there, this, and then I, my, I'm, I'm currently at Pittsburgh Child Guidance Foundation and I've been there for nine years as executive director. And um, we're a small foundation with, where we um, distribute modest amounts of money. Um, we were founded to focus on the emotional health and well-being of children living in Allegheny County. Um, and so for the last, actually, um, close to 20 years, we focused on, um, we've had multi-year projects focuses where we're, um, the first one was around families, children whose parents were incarcerated. So, um, for us, because we're a small foundation with not a lot of money, it's not just about giving money, but we partner with other organizations to try to change practices and policies that are going to make life better for children so that they're not defined 
by these um, adverse childhood experiences. So for example, for um, uh, children of the incarcerated, we worked with the judges and the court system and the wards, warden of the jail to change policies and practice um, and to make the treatment for in the incarcerated more humane. Um, for example, for a long time, they didn't even have discharge planning. So somebody would get, get out of jail, the order would come down that they could be released and the jail would just say, okay, well, we'll wait till it's a slow time and then we'll let them out. So they might let somebody out at two or three o'clock in the morning. They just go down to the cell, go get them and say, you're free, you can go. No planning, nothing. Um, they didn't have a ride home. And I, I talked to um, one, the, one of the wardens who told me the story he said that sometimes they, so they let somebody out, he would leave his shift, he'd come back and they would be in jail the next night because they got picked up, and particularly if it was somebody on solicitation, that they would get rearrested because they were put out on the street with no support system or no plans to as to how they were going to get home or no money or anything. So we worked to change some of those um, policies and procedures, and we're continuing to, to do that. We're currently focused on families with children experiencing homelessness. And the work is really humbling because being homeless I, is, I would think is unimaginable, but it's a very real problem. In Allegheny County, the estimate is that there are probably at least 3,000 children who are homeless. A lot of it is invisible. So we don't, that's why it's hard to say what the count is if people are doubled up or they're concerned about losing their children to um, the system. So we don't really have a, a good count, but that's a relatively good, accurate estimate. Um, so we um, we have provided financial support just to highlight a couple of them. There's one organization we've worked with called Beverly's Birthday, and I just love what they do. They go into shelters and to schools that are based in low income areas and give birthday parties. And all of the kids who come get a present and they have a pizza party and everything. And it just enables kids to participate in this rite of passage that so many of us take for granted. Um, we have another um, East Liberty based partner uh, for those of you in Pittsburgh, the um, East Liberty um, uh, EECM, and I'm blanking on the name, Ministry, East Liberty Ministry. Um, anyway, they um, run a summer day camp for the kids who are living. It's a combination shelter and also a drop in center for lunches. Um, and they, we have funded them to um, pro provide day camp for kids in the summer. And it's a combination of activities plus education programs because um, one of the issues is when kids are not engaged and they're out of school for an extended period of time, there's a tremendous amount of backsliding that happens um, with learning curves. So um, those are just a couple of examples of the kinds of programs we support. Another one was there was a um, a cell phone up of um, we have we collaborated with a software designer on the creation of an initiative called Big Bird um, to help mitigate the circumstances of those experiencing homelessness. Um, so we were in, in addition to being the first funder in for this, we helped with the development, the testing, and the launch of Big Bird. And what it does is based by, on age and gender and needs, and it helps to um, people find free basic necessities, food, shelter, clothing. Mental health is a big issue. Sometimes we have, there's one button that says, um, I just need somebody to talk to. So for people who are really stressed um, and going through a tough time that it can connect them with um, street teams and resources. Um, and the thing is that this is web-based and it's also um, on the cell phone. It's not a true app, but the idea is that ordinary people can help anybody. You can download it and say to somebody, you know, that they want food. Here's where the nearest shelter is. It geolocates and tells people where to go to get the help that they need. So that, that's, that's um, how I spend my days these days. And it's, uh, as I said, humbling, but it's also very gratifying work. Pam, what impact has the Black Lives Movement had on you personally? And tell us a little bit about your work in the African-American community. 
Okay. The um, so this is let's take a look at the Ralph Bank study. This study came out about three weeks ago, and it speaks volumes and not in a good way. I mean, Pittsburgh is really behind. And when I said early on about this is about the devil you know versus the devil you don't know. So these are things that we cannot be proud of and really do need to be addressed. Um, that Pittsburgh has the highest share of black households with, with children that are headed, female headed. Um, that in and of itself is not bad. But when you start to look at the lack of participation in the labor force, the highest number of black males aged 25 to 54, not in the labor force, one in three is not in the labor force. Um, third highest among black females um, ages 25 to 54, also out of the, the labor force. And this is the top 50 cities in the country. And so the fact that we are ranking here. So, and for each of these measures, Pittsburgh's black white disparities are among the highest, the disparities are among the highest in those 50 cities. So, I mean, it, it, it really, it shows the sorry state of things for people of color. Um, so I personally have tried to, throughout my career, engage in work that's meaningful and that is also going to have a, a positive impact, impact, not on just the population at large, but also on people of color. So I've tried to engage in things with that um, through mentoring, hiring practices, um, and other things that will help uplift the the community. Um, so one of my current projects, I'm I'm I sit on the board of the Allegheny County, County Library Association, and that's 45 libraries outside of the Carnegie Library of Pittsburgh system. And the thing about the um, the ACLA, the county, county libraries, is that in many cases, librarians tend to be white females and the boards tend to be comprised of black, I'm sorry, of white males. So um, I'm working to create greater equality of opportunity by working with the libraries. Um, I've come up with this idea of to create a talent bank where people can nominate themselves to participate on a committee and potentially a board or, or to be hired by a library. So um, participants will receive some basic training so that they understand the duties of the committee or a board and they'll be matched with their local libraries. So one of the things, a common practice in recruiting for committees and libraries is that we go to our own networks. We go to people we know. So the idea is with the talent bank is to diversify our committees and boards to make the libraries a more welcoming community and to increase opportunities for people who might otherwise be overlooked. Um, and it, I, you know, so many of us, we love our libraries. We, so many people um, have stories about the impact of libraries um, on their lives. I think of August Wilson who would always tell the story about he skipped school and nobody ever came in and said to him, why aren't you in school? And he would stand outside and bounce a basketball against the wall. So they knew he wasn't in class, but nobody ever came and got him. But he actually self-educated by going to the library. I also, I used to go to the library downtown and take a meditation class. <laughs> so um, libraries are great and we just need to be more inclusive. So that's, um, this ACLA talent bank that we're actually launching this week. Um, I'm hoping that we can achieve that goal um, with it. Um, the Aurora Reading Club is a small organization, small but old organization that we celebrate. This is the um, 125th anniversary celebration that was held, well, actually a year and a half ago now, um, 2019. Um, uh, which I co-chaired, a past president of the organization and was co I co-chaired this particular event. Um, but the, the organization was established in 1894 and it was born out of necessity. I actually had two relatives. It was started by six women and two of them were my ancestors. Um, but, you know, when you think about the Ralph Bangs study you go back to 1894, the purpose for that was 
African Americans could not walk into the William Penn and say, well, we want to have tea and we want to discuss books. So these women started the Aurora Reading Club and they would travel to each other's homes. So this is 1894. They're going to homes by horse and buggy, sometimes staying overnight because they couldn't, you know, you couldn't, it was not a day trip. But they would read books, they would have guest speakers, and they would talk about the order of the day. And the um, the overarching goal was um, self-improvement. They were committed to um, self-improvement. So I'm a fourth generation member and I'm, to be very candid, when I joined, it was actually kind of under duress. My, my uncle had his um, knee in my, my back and saying, you, you will now join. And so I did. And actually now I'm very grateful to be a, a part of such um, an important organization that continues to make contributions to the community. And um, actually the club was, um, is mentioned in, I don't know if you know, Smoketown, the Mark Whitaker book, but um, Aurora and many of its members are mentioned in the club. And we are, um, I've been the historian for the past six or seven years and our, um, our archives are stored at the History Center. And um, so from time to time, there some of the exhibits are relate to Aurora and what we do. Let, let me jump in the, those of you who have not read Smoketown uh, by Mark Whitaker, it's an amazing book. It is the history of uh, the African American community in Pittsburgh, particularly in the Hill District. And uh, it has amazing um, stories. And it is really something I read uh, a year or two ago. It's very profound because, uh, because Pittsburgh is so lack but were de facto segregated and certainly when we were growing up it was oh we wouldn't go into the hill district we wouldn't do those type of things uh i know some uh family members had businesses there but it was it was a territory that in 1968 70 so so we didn't we didn't go to but the rich history of the pittsburgh courier and uh robert vance the editor uh, of the longtime editor, who was the first person who who moved to um, take the African American community from the GOP, from the Republican Party in 1932, through the platform of the Pittsburgh Courier, which was a national publication with hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and moved them to the Democratic Party. Uh, and uh, that has also uh, started really here as, as one of the leaders. So it's an amazing book. I can't plug it enough. So any of you smoked on, I would strongly encourage you will see and hear, read and hear things that you knew and some things you did. So um, I'm going to move on, Pam, to tell us about some of the organizations you volunteer with now and some of your work. Okay. So I'm actually on several boards right now. I serve on the um, Staunton Farm Foundation, and which focuses on mental behavioral health issues. Um, the Children's Institute Board, which serves children with uh, significant mental, emotional, and physical health challenges. Um, the Allegheny County Library Association, which I, we talked about. And then I'm also a member of the um, Regional Assets a district advisory board which distributes taxpayer dollars to regional organizations and so i'll talk a little bit about that a little bit later but um so i do i sit on boards and those are interesting and you can get to make decisions and things like that but um so one, a couple of the things that i particularly enjoyed i wanted to do some hands-on work so i became involved with two things one is every i haven't done it since covid but i We'll go to the food bank and I pack boxes and um, it's fun. I like it. Um, and, you know, I'm just grateful that that there's a resource to help people in need and grateful that that I haven't had that need, but um, I'm glad that it's there. Um, I had several family members who were in hospice care at their end of their lives, and I found it to be really compassionate way of dealing with death. And um, so I trained and became a hospice volunteer. And that's, again, I haven't done anything since COVID, but I'm um, what's called a vigil volunteer. So I get called in 
at the very end when um, people were probably not not recovering. Um, but that's very rewarding. I, I take the, so the, the books, um, I just read, so, so I have um, some Kelly Gibran, um, a, a, a Tear and a Smile, um, Randy Pausch from CMU, I don't know if people might know his name. Um, so his last lectures, which are really powerful. And then I have this bag, I call it my go kit, and it has these different things in it, these books and um, readings. And then I have I, a CD and I just take music, um, calming music and, and just go in and sit with the people and read to them so that, you know, they're not alone at the end. Um, and that's pretty rewarding. Um, but so other work I um, was previously, I was appointed by Mayor Murphy. I was um, chair of the Human Relations Commission for, well, chair for two or three years and I served on it for I think a total of seven or eight years. Um, and we heard and decided on employment cases. If people didn't want to go through the court system, they could ask for, and they lived in the city of Pittsburgh or the infraction had occurred in the city of Pittsburgh, they could ask for a hearing, could take their case to the Human Relations Commission. And these were for discrimination and housing um, cases. And so in many cases, we were able to right some wrongs. In some cases, actually some of the staff went out and tested the system. They would send people out, say a white person to apply for, can I live here? And then a black person and see how they were treated differently. And, and actually there was a huge lawsuit get brought against, I can't remember the name of the company now. They're now known as Mozart, but they, had, they changed their name because they, they got in trouble big time on discrimination. Um, and that was because of the work of the Human Relations Commission. So um, I mentioned RAD, the Regional Asset District. Um, for those living outside of Pittsburgh, RAD was started 25 years ago through a vote by um, Allegheny County residents who agreed to pay an extra 1% on sales tax within Allegheny County. So then this money is distributed to libraries, the zoo, aviary, FIPS, um, conservatories, stadiums, and um, arts organizations. And so what it's done is it's been able to help them stabilize some of their, their income. And um, so RAD collects the money and then redistributes it to these organizations. And um, so as an advisory member, we make site visits and get sometimes get to, to make recommendations to the, the um, board, which is appointed, is also appointed um, about where the funding goes. And so over the course of 25 years, more than $2 billion has been distributed. So that has worked really well. So um, I've, I've also served on, I was chair of the uh, Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures Board for one year and on that board for seven or eight years and had a number of great experiences with with, with that, but we'll talk about that a little bit later, so. So there was a question in the chat room. Okay. Uh, do you think that the impact of the jobs, did that have to, does that have to do with the steel mills and the manufacturers and the transformation from a blue collar inside the city to a more tech informational based healthcare, uh, the impact upon the African-American community? What's your thoughts on that? So, um, so definitely, I mean, things went down in, in, in the 70s because in the 70s for a long time, people would, you know, you could graduate from high school and just go go in the mill and, and you know, work there for 25 years and, and have a, you know, earn a living wage and have a well-paying job. And then when the um, jobs went overseas and the mill started to close and that was actually the out migration and it took, probably a, almost a generation, 20 years for things to come back. And so this, the, um, the success, the conversion for Pittsburgh was in diversifying the economy. So it was meds, eds, um, it was real universities, um, it was technology, um, to some degree, um, financial sector. But the important thing was that we weren't reliant on one, manufacturing is still very big as well, but we weren't reliant on one 
industry as we had been previously. I would not, I don't think it's that, if I'm understanding question, question correctly, it's not the sectors, meds and eds, that left African Americans behind. It's, there's so many other things. Um, it's the racial segregation, it's policies, it's hidden bias. It's those kinds of things that have left people out. And so the other issue is around, I mean, if you get off to a rocky start, and this is one of the reasons that we're so focused on the issues around homeless. And I'm also looking at some issues around early education, because if you get off to a rocky start, you never catch up. So, you know, up to third grade, you learn to read. And then from third grade on, you should be reading to learn. But if you don't have a good foundation, it's not happening. And you just never, ever, ever catch up. And I, but I think it's hidden biases and say, I don't think it's the sectors. Um, but it, I mean, it's hidden, it's hidden biases. And I also, I mean, I just think, I think about the unions that frankly didn't embrace women and didn't embrace um, people of color until they were in trouble and their numbers started diminishing. And then they're now all of a sudden they're opening the tents and, and being more inclusive. Um, so it was, it, it was a, it's a combination of things. So the other thing actually, so just in terms of stability and um, wealth, accruing wealth, uh, one of the, the fastest, the easiest ways to acquire wealth, which brings stability has to do with the housing. It actually has to do with that because so you, you own a home, you pass it on to your kids or you sell it, you gain income and hopefully you make money on that transition, that property transition, the sale of it. And then it gets passed down from generation. Well, I mean, the thing is that there was redlining in the African-American community. So the banks would say, okay, these areas say Homewood, the Hill are flagged as undesirable. So the prices get depressed. Um, there's a lack of home, you can't get a loan. So there's no home ownership. So there's a lot of renting going on, but there's not home ownership. So wealth is not acquired and passed on through because of the system. So, I mean, it's, it's a, these are systemic, a lot of these are systemic problems that really need to be addressed and that, you know, we need to own up to. So I hope okay. that answers. Okay, Pat, I'm gonna, uh, we'll come back to the question and answer period about that, that in an open discussion. I'm gonna talk about some of your travels. So here you are on a horse, where where are you? What you doing? You know, and I don't actually, that's like a donkey or something, but I'm not, I love to horseback ride. And so when I can, I, um, so in the Caribbean, Florida, lots of places um, out in Arizona, I, I like, I like just like, like horses, like to horseback ride. But um, my travels, um, so, um, I think the thing I'm one of the things I miss the most um, about this lockdown is being forced to stay home. My last two trips were over a year ago to first coast in February 2020. I was in Costa Rica and then in New York. And I, on my, I have a bucket list that has probably 15 to 20 countries and states on it. But I've been to Australia twice. And so, Chuck, you were mentioning about Chuck and his. Um, involvement with Rotary. I actually, so I made two trips. One, the first trip to Australia was as a guest of the government. And that was a connection through my um, work with National Geographic. And um, so I got to go to Australia. Then I was invited, I was a, on a cultural exchange program through Rotary and got to go back to Australia and Papua New Guinea. So, so there I am, this is Papua New Guinea. Um, in case you haven't noticed, I'm wearing pearls. <laughs> And um, these are the mud men of Papua New Guinea. And they were actually one of the last um, communities that practiced cannibalism. So um, that was another interesting experience. I've also, I've been to Brazil. Um, I was in China interest, uh, three or four years ago, been all over Europe. 
um, UK, Scandinavia, Cuba. I loved Cuba right after President Obama opened it and reestablished relationship. I woke up one morning and said, I know, I'm going to Cuba. Um, and the interesting thing, one of the interesting things about Cuba was that, so we had this, um, we weren't doing um, an economic exchange with them where we, you know, we didn't, we weren't importing. So what they would do, particularly with seafood and certain things, they'd send them down to Brazil. Brazil would put their labels on them and then they'd ship them to the United States. So there really was, you know, there was still trade going on. That was kind of the wink, wink joke. Um, a couple of years ago, I went to Iceland. That was fantastic. That was really amazing. Um, I went to Tahiti. And that, that was a stopover on my way back from Australia on one of my Australia trips. Been to most of the states in the US. I have still a few more to go. Um, I had the opportunity to go to Northern Ireland and stay in this beautiful old hotel that was, um, it used to get bombed regularly during the troubles um, because the media stayed there during the war and they won for war for independence with Britain and they wanted to call attention. So they would just bomb it regularly. Um, but anyway, so I love to travel and I can't wait to get going again. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk a little bit about some of the people you met. Okay, so <laughs> Dick Cavett was, um, he was involved with, I think it was um, our Once Upon a Classic series, but I just remember flying with him and he's great, brilliant man, very funny. And um, but a white knuckle flyer. We hit. We flew it back from to Pittsburgh from New Orleans, and it was a rocky flight. He didn't do well, but a, a, a great guy. <laughs> um, so tell us about Al. Uh, yeah. Oh, so the, I mentioned earlier about we did this Previn in the Pittsburgh series, and so this was late in her career, and so she didn't sing. It was an interview format between uh, Maestro Previn and um, Ella Fitzgerald, and it was just amazing I, I did i get to meet her at the reception afterwards but it was just amazing to be in her presence what a great great lady tell uh, us about these this guy this is jacques pepin who is a he's a, a a french chef i don't know if people recognize the name he's written a number of books um but he came to pittsburgh um for an event and i got to ride home with him but it wasn't a regular ride. Um, we flew in a private plane to his house. Um, his wife picked us up. I went to his home and had an apple tart in his kitchen. And then I flew back to Pittsburgh. So that was great. And then, okay. then there's Delia Owen's book, Where the Crawdad Sings. And she's, she's the, the one and her, her husband, Mark also gets a credit on this book. But they, um, as I mentioned, were National Geographic special producers before she became a best-selling author. And it, you know, one of my regrets is she actually, they invited me to visit them in, in Africa. And I didn't go, I just haven't been to Africa yet only because I haven't been able to put together the amount of time I feel like it would take to to go there that that it's on my list but but um, that's the Delia Owen story. And uh, let me let, let, tell me about some more about August Wilson and your involvement. So um, he was a great guy. He was just this really very humble man. Um, and so I I I, I did know him and. Um, so when he, when the, this was, Radio Golf was his last production. It was the the 10th in his cycle. And to pay homage to him, I actually became involved um, as a, made a financial contribution to help bring Radio Golf to Broadway. Um, it, it, candidly, it is not one of his better places. It's not one of his stronger places, mostly because he died while he was working on it and didn't, I don't, I don't believe really got to to finish it, but it did open on Broadway, and he did win a number of awards for it. And um, I got so I got to go to the opening night and the pre and post parties, and I just have fond memories of of him. So, and how about this dude? Tell us about <laughs> the, your experience with him. Okay. Yeah, so that is you probably wouldn't know, but he's that's Carl Sondheimer. 
and he was the inventor of the Cuisinart. And he came to Pittsburgh for a promotional tour. And so I spent the day with him and I just listened to him. We started very early in the morning. This was in the days when they had the AM talk shows. It started really early. And by late morning, I'd been listening to him all day. We're riding around on a limousine and between stops, he's on the phone and he's bullying his staff in New York about and complaining about this and complaining about that. And so late in the morning, we're on our way to lunch at the Duquesne Club and he starts in on me and I just thought, I don't work for you. I don't have to put up with this. And he came at me and I, I just gave it back to him. Um, so we made it through the day. There was a big party at the end, said our goodbyes. I left, went away for the weekend. I come back, there's this big box on my door. He sent me a Cuisinart. That was more than 35 years ago and I still have the Cuisinart and still use it. <laughs> So that's my but, Carl Sondheimer but, story. But he didn't sign it, did he? <laughs> no, he, did. he <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I think we know this is. Tell us about the, about yeah. the justice. So, um, she, she came for, the, um, um, for Pittsburgh Arts and Lectures. Um, her, she was relatively newly appointed to the court and had just had released her book, I think just before she was voted on to the, uh, the court. And I got to go to the reception and I, I told her how much my father enjoyed her book, but he wasn't feeling well that evening and he couldn't go to the, ele the lecture. But I thanked her for being in Pittsburgh and then went on my way. And a couple minutes later, I felt this tap on my shoulder and I turned around and it was uh, Justice Sotomayor and she said, I want to sign a book for your father. And so she did and I just was touched by her graciousness. So, and I, so I just have a, a um, couple of other stories. I um, had the opportunity, I met um, chef and author Anthony Bourdain, who's funny and charming as he appeared to be on his television shows. And I have to say, I was very saddened by his, his suicide. Um, and over the years I've had, I've attended events with get, where the guests of honors have included um, Prince Charles, Queen Noor of Jordan, Congressman John Lewis, and the Dalai Lama. Um, uh, and uh, author Muriel Sparks, um, we all read The Prime of Miss Jean Brody, um, and um, was the one who introduced me to Strand Books, the Strand Bookstore in New York. Um, she loved rare books. And all I can tell you is she was a really fierce negotiator when it came to purchasing them. <laughs> so, but she was great. Okay, so tell us about this award here and this, this uh, Voices in the Pennsylvania Commission for Women. Okay, so I was selected, I was one of 50 women across the state who was honored to women of color um, voices. And we, um, they interviewed us, we wrote about our, um, I was strategies, um, have, you know, what, how we became successful and what we did, what we did in our careers. And, you know, they were, the idea was voices for next generations. And uh, so it was an honor to be in, included in that um, from 50 women across Pennsylvania. Okay, so so tell us about the FBI Citizens Academy. <laughs> so one of the things is I'm a lifelong learner, and um, I look just like to try new things. So and you can so I'm going to tell you I'm not right now I'm not a, I'm not a good shot. So a few years ago I learned about a program that would the was offered by the FBI um, Citizens Academy. It's an eight week program, and um, you need to be nominated. Um, but the idea was that they wanted to build relationships with people in the community. And what I was struck by was a comment that was made by one of the agents at our first class. And he said, we learned a tough lesson with 9-11. Um, they previously, they had the attitude, we don't need the community involved in our business. Um, you know, we, there's just no role. We, we know what we're doing and just stand back and we'll do our jobs. Um, and the tough le that was the tough lesson was that, yes, there was a role for ordinary citizens. Um, so they 
established the Citizens Academy to begin to build bridges with the community. And um, I was nominated two, two years ago and went through the program and it was fascinating. We heard from agents and analysts about the work that they do related to cybersecurity, um, protecting children from predators, stopping hate crimes, international drug trafficking and healthcare fraud. And then um, program graduates were able to go. We went to DC and to visit the FBI headquarters. We were at Quantico. We went to Hogan's Alley, which is their mock city where they um, train law enforcement officials. They have a high speed um, driving range and they have like a, a part of a, 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 the Hogan's Alley looks like a, um, a um, brownstone in New York and so that they have to go up three or four stories to um, do whatever it is they need to do. They, um, they also they boast that they have the most robbed bank in America in Hogan's Alley because that's where they do bank robbery training and evidence gathering. And um, and then we we also went to the Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Um, there's, you know, as, as we all know, there's a lot of tension between law, and official, law enforcement officials and people of color, the co of communities. So um, one of the ways to change behaviors and attitudes is to have more people of color um, on the law enforcement team. And so some of, I've been trying to do some things to bridge some of those, those gaps. But it, I mean, it, it, this was a fascinating program. It was, I, I went through the program, actually at the time I was going through China and I, they talked about cybersecurity and they, they said, one of the things I learned was they said, everybody's job in China is to spy. And it's to, you know, as I heard that they said, when I told them I, I was going, I got to talk to some of the agents and they said, um, you know, take a burner phone. I, I couldn't take a burner phone for any, some any number of reasons, mostly because I had my music and games and stuff on it. And, and it was a really, really, really long flight. But I did take, I took off all my contacts. I told people not to text me, not to contact me because China's attitude is anything that you take into the country becomes property of the country. So um, I just, I took all of those things off. And then at the end, we had this great um, tour guide and his name was Snow. And at the end, he said, you know, I'd really like to practice my English and his English was not very good. But he said, you know, I'd like to stay in touch with you, you know, and he's, he was asking for emails and things. And so there was a time I would say, oh, yeah, here's my email. Here's my home phone number. Here's my address. Here's my social security. Now, like going through the FBI program, there was like no way. I was like, I, you know, I mean, I thought as much as I'd like to help you, I am not touching that because part of the problem was that they'll send you an email that will have spyware in it. When we, when I would take the class at, at the FBI headquarters, we weren't able to take our smartphones or our watches or um, anything. And we had to leave them in, in the car. And even the agents, a lot of the agents aren't able to do that. Some of them can bring them in certain, but there are certain secure areas because um, that where they're, they're not allowed, even they are not allowed to take their phones in because of malware and the spying that goes on at a, a, an unparalleled level. So, but that was, so that was a really big learning lesson for me. Okay, Our, my final question before we open it up for questions and comments from the uh, audience, our classmates and everybody else. Tell, tell, tell us how Peabody had that impact upon you. That's always the question we end with. What would what, what, what Peabody mean and, and okay, how so did it help you or hurt you or harm or whatever? No, you know what? So it was really good. So you were asking me in the beginning, like the nurses, because I said I was a member of the future nurse. My mother was a nurse. And um, so and I was a, the, big, the big thing was it afforded me opportunity to try some things out. It, I, I could learn what I liked. I could learn what I didn't like. I could learn what I was good at. I could also learn what I wasn't good at. It was a safe place to learn, was also a safe place to fail. So, you know, it was that, and it was um, the cultural experiences. I remember I went to um, Seder dinner at um, a friend's house. Um, uh, we also hosted um, Jewish friends at our home 
for a Christmas tree decorating party so that there was a cultural bridge that was being built. Um, there was a lot of encouragement from the teachers and some, not all the guidance counselors and um, as well as fellow students. And it was, it was also, it was, it was a more innocent time, but it was also a time of activism. And um, so, I mean, it, it actually, so as I've listened to people talk, I'm just struck by the phenomenal achievements of so many people. I mean, I think, we, you know, I mean, I think we got a good um, launch, they had a good launching pad um, in Peabody High School and in being a Highlander. So um, it was great. So thank you for this. It was my honor. Um, this was a real privilege. So I'll open it up for discussion comments. So anyone who wants to, to uh, ask a question or make a comment, uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself and talk. Bob, hey, I'm this Mr. Is Sharon. I am so proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you, Sharon. It's so good to see you. What kind of nurse were you? Who, Sharon? Yeah. Oh, uh, I've done emergency room, med surge nursing, mental health, geriatrics. Wow. I've taught. Um, and my last 20 years was in administration, and I finished as the deputy chief nurse for the VA Maryland healthcare system. Wow. Okay. Home care. I've done home care, and I've done research, too. Wow. Well, that's great. Okay. Who else wants to ask a question or make a comment? Bob, this is Gary. Um, Go ahead. First, uh, Pam, uh, uh, an amazing journey. Uh, uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Uh, you really are a remarkable person. Uh, you alluded to your family sort of tangentially a number of times uh, during your talk. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit more about the family influences on you. And the history, like how far back and all. Go ahead. Right. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, the, my family. I mean, I I had a really good grounding. So it came from a traditional family. My um, father was was actually was a pharmacist who um, he graduated from Duquesne University. And the, so the interesting thing we start to talk about race and racial bias. So he um, um, did very well in school. But you know, the, one of the teachers told him one time he got a B, I think, in a class or an A minus or something, because they told him he couldn't get the top grade because he was Af he was black. So you know, I mean, so the, you know, we've been dealing with this stuff for a long time. But my father, so he was a pharmacist, and then decided he really didn't like it, so he went back to school and got his teaching degree, and then he taught at Westinghouse High School. He was actually started at a middle school and then went to Westinghouse High School where he was head of the science department and taught um, um, physics and um, I don't think he, he didn't teach chemistry, but, um, but he loved, 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 loved teaching. Um, my mother was a nurse and she has a story too. Her story was she came, came from Johnstown and she all, all her life, she, all, she wanted to be a nurse. And when she graduated from high school, she couldn't go to nursing school because of the color of her skin. But right. she, she never gave up on that dream. And so she married my father and moved to Pittsburgh. And then, so there were three of us. And after um, my brother was the youngest and when, when he was in school, she went back to school and she got her LPN. So she never gave up on her dream. But, um, you know, so the, the racial issues have had an impact on our family, you know, for a long time. So, but in terms of family, so um, I, I think um, it traces back, I'm gonna say mid 1800s from Virginia. And one of the things that was interesting um, is um, I got invited to an event at Dollar Bank a few years ago and I got to go in this private entrance and I walked in and I looked up and on the left and my family members are their pictures are up there these are ancestors from um, the 1800s they were some of the among the first depositors at Dollar Bank and um, so 
I actually, and, 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 I, and I also have a great, great uncle who was the first graduate of Pitt Med School, was precursor to Pitt Med School. Um, and so Dollar Bank, because they were de also depositors at Dollar Bank, they actually have this archives. So I've donated some of our things and you can see them in um, the, the private section, which is actually open to, to the public. I don't know if it's open now or not, but open to the public. So some of those things are, are there, but family influence was, um, it was, it was big, um, um, you know, and, and they, you know, they were supportive and we were, uh, you know, so in addition to Peabody, we talked about the arts, but, um, you know, my mother used to take us, we would go to the playhouse to, um, you know, theater productions were a little, so we were introduced to the arts early on and, and um, those, the nuclear family and that family support really matters. And I, that's um, one of the things that, why I've struggled so much when I think about these kids who are homeless and sleeping in cars or doubled up and the, you know, instability and insecurity and the impact that it can have for the rest of one's life. But Gary, thanks for that question. Okay, I need a great answer. Well, go ahead. Anyone else? Okay. Okay, then uh, Bob, uh, Bob, go, some, go Lee, ahead, Lee. Lee. Hi, Pam. Hi, uh, what, what a beautiful presentation you made. Um, I asked Bob to ask the question about uh, the transition from blue collar to white collar mm -hmm. and how that, how that hurt uh, the community. And uh, your answer it touched on a lot of things in, in general, but it didn't really focus in on any one particular item. And I, I think what I, I, I wanted to hear, and maybe you don't know the answer is, in, you know, back in the 60s and 50s when, when the steel mills were belching out money left and right, and people were getting jobs all, like you said, you graduated high school and you went into the mill. A after the mills basically all shut down and there was that transition, why was the, why was the black community not brought along with everybody else? Is, is, that, is that the systemic racism that we hear about and that yeah. you're telling me in I, yeah. so I so part of it is I wasn't I'm not trying to dodge the the question but I it's it's complex it's no, it, from where I sit it's not one thing but it's a whole bunch of things um, that it can either work for or work against um, and so the thing is um, there's not a strong African-American middle class in Pittsburgh. So um, some of the issues are that people, you know, that, that African-Americans end up on the lowest rung and get left behind. I mean, when, you know, if you start to look at that bang study that, you know, that a third of the, the African-American male population is, is out of the labor force. And this is at the time when you're, st you're supposed to be working 25, 21, 25 to 54. That's when you're accruing wealth, you're building your nest egg, your retirement, those kinds of things. And so, you know, if you're, you know, last in line, and so there are a couple of things. So one of the things is that there was a huge out migration. So it wasn't just, um, I mean, it was, everybody in that demographic that was feeling the impact. But if, if you're on the lowest rung, you know, frankly, you know, you might not be, you're not necessarily in that set of considerations. So, I mean, so, so it was, I would say it's a, a combination of systemic racism um, and just, just a lot of complex things that, that, um, you know, converged in a very bad way to leave the African American community behind. Because when you look, like I said, now, so we, these are like two generations. If you go for 50 years, that's two generations. And when you look at these statistics, 
that that Ralph Bang study is not a month old, and that's where we are today. That we're still feeling that, you know, there was the those issues. So, and okay. that I mean, there were you know things like we talked about the Hill District that um, was gutted. I mean, that was at one point that was a very a thriving community. It was gutted. Um, frankly, to make way for the civic arena, people were displaced. It broke up the neighborhoods. The lack of home ownership. I mean, it's all of those things. So, the, so it's hard to answer because it's not just you can't point to one thing and say, "Here's what happened." Yeah, they do, do not underestimate the impact of the civic arena. So, what that project was in the '50s, David Lawrence and the politicians and the people decided what they wanted to do was unite downtown Pittsburgh with Oakland right. by essentially had a three-phase plan to essentially redevelop, gentrify the Hill District. Uh, so the first part of the plan was the purchase of the area around Crawford Street and south of that for the Civic Arena, and they condemned everybody and moved them out and but they what they also did, and this is uh, some research I've done in, in reading, they took the part of the next phase and condemned more land than they needed. Right. So that's why for the last 50 years, there has been empty parking lots above the Civic Arena. Mm -hmm. So they wiped out all those businesses and all that community, over 200 businesses, many very solid brick buildings, a, a thriving quite frankly, multi-generational, multi-diversity community, and they, and they wiped that out. 